feel like my perspective doesn't necessarily fit into the conversation. I do find myself at times feeling insecure diving into these topics. My perspective is rooted in what I know. In other words, the insecurity doesn't stem from I don't know what I'm talking about. The insecurity stems from my perspective probably might not be popular and that makes me insecure straight up. I asked if I could take some time to really think about this and as I started to process what I was being asked to contribute, I realized how important my perspective is and I was also being invited to break down the process I went through. I did have a lot of emotions that were flaring because of this book and you know it did involve Oprah which also added another layer of pain for me so I thought you know what my voice is valid my perspective is valid and I think it is important for my community to hear my perspective on topics like these so here we are we have a beautiful episode with Latina podcasters founders Rita Bautista from Empowerment and All That Nicole Hernandez from The Daring Kind, Denise Solar Cox from Project Enye, Rosalia Rivera from About Consent Podcast, and Brenda Gonzalez from Tamarindo Podcast. Hello, I'm Janine Cummins. This is my new novel, American Dirt. Oh, I love it so much. Why? Well, first of all, from Hi, the, Janine Cummins. Hi, Hi Janine, Janine Cummins. Cummins from the here very, as well. From the very first I was in. I was in from the very first sentence. We should say this book is receiving critical acclaim for its powerful portrayal of a migrant's journey across the border to the U.S. It focuses on this. And if you're going to listen to anything, American Dirt is the perfect one to listen to. I always knew that I wanted to write about immigration. Um, I was interested in that topic, and I, I wasn't. I resisted for a very long time. I subsequently learned that the publishing industry was all a buzz about this was going to be a breakthrough, uh, a, a breakthrough book. I was reading it, found myself bored. When I was finished with it, I sat there wondering why it was such a slog to get through, why the book felt so formulaic and so soulless. And then it hit me that yeah, this book has no soul because the author doesn't understand the story she set out to write. It grossed me out. It grossed me out that this novel was being constructed as a blockbuster. It, it, it's, its bestseller status was preordained. It was an anointed work. And uh, as an anointed work, I got to observe all this machinery come into place in order to elevate the book and prop it, it up. It could be a great piece of fiction. It could be whatever it is. But in this day and age where we are breaking away from the thievery of other people's expressions, <laughs> it's not It's not happening. It's not, it's not working for other folk who do not partake in the predominant this culture is that is used why to publishers it. are stupid. Part two. Part two. This time... It's personal. I think what you're seeing is nothing less than the decline and fall of the, what I call the folklorico industrial complex of U.S. Latino literature. The novel is different from a piece of journalism, a piece of nonfiction. It's different from a script. You know, it has its own engine and it's got a roar from Light page your book one. says, and while there are valid me. criticisms around our promotion of this book, that is no excuse for threats of physical violence. The novel by Janine Cummins is about a Mexican mother and her young son fleeing to the U.S. border. Cummins is of Irish and Puerto Rican descent. On social media, a firestorm. One person writing, this book is a harmful, stereotypical, and inaccurate representation of Mexican immigrants. Cummins responded to the backlash, saying she did five years of research. Because voices of color and women's voices have been hijacked for a very long time. When I first heard about the book, my initial thoughts were heavily charged with the emotion of pain and the emotion of anger. Welcome to the podcast, Let There Be Lose. I'm your host, Linda Garcia, also known as Lose Warrior. And I think what hurt me the most was seeing that Oprah was at the center of the pain that the community was feeling. Like many other people, I absolutely adore Oprah. I see her as one of my greatest teachers 
and the person that put me on my spiritual path. And so I really wanted to assess her positioning, why she felt the need to endorse this book, why it was important to her, and just really understand her perspective because that was the most detrimental relationship that was on the line for me as all of this information was coming through. I almost really didn't care about the author. It was more so who was endorsing this book. And there were so many in our community that were endorsing the book that I was a little confused. There was a big why. Why was the book being embraced in this way by people of color? And what was it in the book that moved them to feel this way? Did they really read the book? Did they themselves at one point question why our story was being told via a white woman at this specific moment in time? The more and more I gave it time, the more I decided that I was not interested in reading the book. That if I was to read the book, it was to prove some point to myself. Once I solidified the decision of not reading the book, I felt really empowered in taking my power back in protecting the way I personally feel and also protecting the work that I've done to heal my spirit. What I focus on expands. And so if I participate in something that is not serving me, it's not serving my higher self, then it's not helping the collective as a whole. You have one new message. To listen to your messages, press one. For re- American Dirt was a wake-up call for many entities, but I want to talk about three in particular. The publishing industry book lovers and quote-unquote allies. The publishing industry clearly got a little slap in the face. Brenda is one of the hosts of the Marindo podcast. And the reason why I chose her, other than just loving her podcast, I really love her point of view. And I don't always agree with her point of view, but I love how confident she is in her point of view. And I also love how bold she is when she shares her point of view. The publishing industry clearly got a little slap in the face and was shaken up by this. And that is 100% because of the work of the organizers behind Dignidad Literaria and specifically Mayra Gurba, a Mexican-American writer. So they're going to have to pause and be more thoughtful about how they lift up the stories of of Latinx, those Latinx stories, and maybe actually commit to some goals of reaching out to more writers. Uh, in, I, in my opinion, I think they should be reaching, reaching out to more Mexican-American writers in particular. And then I also think that this was a wake-up call for book lovers because I think a lot of folks in, that are in book clubs that were really excited about this particular book and and just treating the Oprah stamp of approval as the best the best mark for them to decide to select a book i think we're also shaken up and surprised that oh it it matters to represent stories accurately and then i think this was also a wake up call for allies there are many people that were celebrating this book really because it was portrayed as giving a voice to the voiceless, that this was going to depict that that horror story that people are allies hear a little bit about in the news and they know they want to be empathetic to that the migrant journey and what's going on with the drug wars in, in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. They are lightly interested in the issue and they thought that they could be excited to support and lift up a book so that they could feel good and pat themselves on the back. But I think that's going to force allies to dig a little deeper and recognize and listen to the actual voices of the communities that they want to be empathetic to and not feel like they need to have this translated to them through a white woman's lens for it to be palatable. I really think that that's what this American Dirt debacle and debate and discussion is is stirring up. It's helping, forcing allies to be more thoughtful on how they try to amplify 
our stories. I think it's important. We need amplified and we need our stories amplified and we need their allyship. But I think this is going to force them to do their homework and not just feel like, oh, look, this book, this book has that imagery that I know I recognize to be Mexican. And it's about the, the words that I recognize, like drug wars, like la bestia. And um, I'm really happy that we're living in a moment in time that we can, we as Mexican Americans, we as Latinos can check people. And that is what I'm most excited about this American Dirt debacle is that it's, we, we, we own our voice and which we've had, that is ours, and that we're able to check. And I think this is going to be a turning point to how Latinx stories are represented. As I dug in a little deeper, I just I did decide to read. Actually, I should t- I take that back. I decided to listen at first. Hey there, this is Nicole Hernandez, host of the Daring Kind podcast. Such a scandalous book in the way that it was portrayed and the cadence of things that were happening, crimes and killings, and it was rather gripping from the very start. My background is actually in journalism. Um, My graduate work is in journalism. My undergrad is in psychology. And so I decided to just get really curious about it and use my journalistic training to evaluate American dirt. And when I did, a couple things became very clear. Number one, this is a fiction novel. It was quite clear to me that, that the publisher had set such great expectations for this novel that was was just for pure entertainment. Um, And I think that's actually where the trouble began, is that when you take something that is meant for entertainment, let's say it's, it's like the equivalent and it's the equivalent of saying The Bachelor represents... Uh, the true love story of our time. And that is just how absurd the titles and the, and the accolades that were given to American dirt became. They're absurd. So that's kind of where I ended up. I just took the book for what it is, which is a really quick, easy read, not a lot of depth to the characters, but definitely a page turner. Janine Cummings knows how to write a formulaic, um, gripping, suspense thriller novel. And if you take it for that, then I think that you'd actually enjoy the book. I do think when I took it even a step further, I don't believe that Janine fully anticipated to, I, I don't think it was her intent, I should say. I don't think it was her intent to misrepresent the Latin community by any means. I think she did try her best to um, interview the people that she could in um, and to have the, all the sources that she had available to her. And, and still, she was writing a suspense thriller novel that's totally fiction. (laughs) And so I think in that vein, like you cannot expect it to be a true accurate portrayal of someone's life because it was never meant to be. Welcome to the Self-ish Latina podcast where we get to be self-ish together. Okay, are we ready? (laughs) You're so awesome. There is a thing about our stories being told, like whether or not they're told in the best light or the worst light. There is a thing in our community that said, well, at least our stories are being told. And that seems like we can get our chin up over the bar and then we can raise the rest of our body over. And there was backlash against that idea. And I saw it in the Project Enya community with people saying, you know, at first I thought, listen, at least they're talking about us. And then the same, you know, I'm thinking of one person in particular that said, you know, what? and then I changed my mind after I talked to my daughter about it. And Rosalia is also addressing the same thing here. I believe the book is quite significant in the big picture right now in the way that it portrays the immigrant experience and the uh, 
immigrant characters are very exaggerated. And unfortunately, there is a very negative stereotype as it is. And I don't feel that this is helping in any way. So unfortunately, I don't see this as anything that is helping the narrative right now for the Latin culture, for immigrants, and for the culture that lives south of the colonial border. I think that what the anger that is currently being felt for this book is masking indignation and hurt. I think that the indignation aspect is that it was so poorly representative of true Mexican culture. There were a lot of uh, false narratives, again, just talking about how, you know, as one example that they gave in the book, that this main character would be giving a woman that he wants to impress, that he's so fond of, to give her conchas, which is considered to be such a common bread. And it was portrayed in the book to be something that was so um, amazing to give. But yet, if you flipped it culturally, it would be the same as someone giving a woman a donut and, you know, instead of like a creme brulee. And so missing those nuances was just such a gross misrepresentation that I think there was a lot of indignation for the way that it was portrayed for someone who, quote unquote, researched this for five years. They did a very poor job in researching. And so I think indignation for one and hurt for the fact that it was something that this kind of story has been attempted to be told by more authentic writers who understand or are genuine, um, genuinely Latinx writers. And not to say that, yes, she has a percentage of Puerto Rican. Um, so I, I know a lot of people are discussing that, but I also feel like there is an aspect that was denied, like not denied, but, um, neglected within her self of exploring her own culture and maybe that gap has created also more hurt because she as a writer herself as a person didn't had never really embraced that about herself and now she's going and portraying in a different um, Latinx culture in such a grossly misrepresentative or misrepresented way. So I think that the hurt is there from that, but even also from the publishing industry and how they have completely missed the mark and how they continuously look at uh, helping writers who are not people of color to be represented versus giving the true diverse voices a platform. So it's 11. Are we going to jump on? Uh, yeah, maybe at 11. Oh, it's 11. It's 11.05. Um, so what you're about to hear is a conversation between both founders of Latina Podcasters, Rita Bautista and Nicole Hernandez, and myself discussing the entire issue. Hey guys, it's Rita Bautista here, the host and creator of Empowerment and All That Podcast. It's your favorite podcast for women's empowerment. I started the podcast back in May and ever since then, my world has been turned upside down in the most positive way. Okay. <laughs> it says, please request to record permission from the Oh meeting. yeah, let me see if I can. So one of the things I thought was really interesting, um, missing the nuances. I think it's one of the reasons why, in general, this book stood out to me because I could connect to some of the characters in the story, personally, and also just on the on the um, the broader topic. You know, I had my brother came here. My brother, my my father's son came here illegally. His son was actually murdered. 
um, by the drug cartel in Honduras not too long ago. Mm. Sorry, it makes me a little emotional, but um, mm. I think the danger in stereotypes is that you miss the nuances. And mm. when you tell a story and you continue to miss the nuance, you pull the soul out of it, you pull the emotion out of it, and there are people who are continuously living this. I'm sorry, y'all. It's okay. It's okay. I need a second. I'm sorry. I didn't think it was gonna, like I wasn't, raised with my older brother but i can't imagine that pain of like losing your child after not being able to see them again and know that this book comes out and this story and i doubt he even read it or even knows about it right but you know one of the podcasters mentioned that it's like missing the little things that makes this so real and when you're sitting there and you're reading this book and you're listening to it i read it and i listened to the audio and even in the audio it was just like it wasn't, it didn't feel real, but I know it's real because I've lived it and my brothers lived it and my father as a grandfather's lived it. And it's like, this is a true story. And so when you're telling it, if you miss these little details, you're basically taking the emotion and the reality out of it. I, I think just even re in response to what you've said, I was, I came from the book of being able to just like look at it as a fiction novel and suspense and thriller and to take it for entertainment. And I don't have the connection that you do to that story because of a personal experience. Mm -hmm. And so even just hearing you express this emotion and this sadness, I feel, I feel, I feel the empathy for you. And, and it does even now change how I think about this book when I think about someone like you who has that personal experience. It's crazy. I didn't even think I was gonna share that, but it just, I felt compelled to, cause I re-listened to the book again last, uh, yesterday when I was on the airplane and I was like, God. <sighs> Hi, I'm Rosalia Rivera, the founder of About Consent. I'm a consent educator and sexual literacy advocate and the host of the About Consent podcast and course creator of Consent Parenting. I found it quite interesting how people have responded to the fact that she is a quarter Puerto Rican and were really attacking her on that and I can understand the perspective because I've I've been in those um, corners of my own Latinidad where I felt that if I didn't portray myself more Latina then within my own community I would be bullied. I had actually experienced that when I visited El Salvador um, when I was 17 and I didn't speak the language very well and so I can relate to aspects of that but at the same time what I what I found really interesting is that I didn't know that this author was at all Latin until I did more research and, and that information came out and so it was curious for me to try to understand why she didn't lead with that why it was such a, a section of her um, heritage of her lineage that was so much in the background instead of in the forefront. I was definitely triggered when I heard, and she wasn't even Latina. And I thought, who the heck does this woman think she is? That was my first response. And then I later found out that she was a quarter Latina. And my own daughters are a quarter Puerto Rican. I work really hard to instill their Latinidad into them every single day. And I imagine them growing older into women and expressing themselves in a creative way and being criticized in this manner because they only were a quarter Puerto Rican. And it was really hard to ignore the fact that this comes up in our work 
time and time again. And, you know, it's called the enoughness police. You know, we've even called it something. So, you know, Latinos enoughing other Latinos, whether they be 100%, a quarter, 50%. We're just, there's people there that are just like waiting to criticize based on how Latino they think you are. And I'm going to say, I actually, my first thought was, who the heck does this woman think she is? So I almost can't even help my own thinking. But then I had the self-awareness to say, hang on a second. Uh, No, that doesn't disqualify her. People write about communities all the time that they're not a part of. She just unfortunately didn't do it well, right? And my own daughters are a quarter Puerto Rican. And that's when I started thinking about how some people in our community treat each other. And that's when it stung. Like, are you kidding me? Here's yet another example of how we're enoughing each other and disqualifying each other. And is someone going to disqualify my own children? That's not okay with me. Well, first, I want to kind of address something that I used to be a bully. I was a bully about this for years. And it took for me to watch someone that I love very much finally come to me and tell me, like, you're not any better than I am just because you speak Spanish. And I realized what all I was doing was passing on the hurt that I had when I would travel to Honduras and everybody used to call me a Yankee. I was passing that hurt on to my family member who didn't speak Spanish, who eventually teaches herself how to speak Spanish. Okay, so like it was this whole thing. It's like we're passing the pain on to the next person instead of just healing it and saying enough is enough. You're Latina, I'm Latina, how can we support each other? This is ridiculous, you know? And so for that, I I genuinely have to apologize to anyone that I ever hurt in that space because, you know, we have it hard enough as it is as women. If you're brown, you have a problem. If you're white, you have a problem. If it's, it's like everybody has a battle that they're already facing. And if we continue to add on more BS, It's just like layers that never end. And it's it's a historical trauma that we still have yet to to like really heal through. You know, I mean, people in our countries, colorism is like the thing, you know, and then we come to this country, which is very black and white still to this day. And we're trying to find our space here. And then on top of that, we're here. And then they lump us in one under one name. And then on top of that, those people are categorizing themselves through colorism. It's like layers of BS that we just can't, we just need to stop and say, I'm sorry. I didn't realize what I was doing was passing the hurt along to the next person and damaging you even more. We just need to stop. As the controversy escalated, we learned that the book tour was canceled. Some libraries pulled the book from their bookshelves. Miriam Gurba, who was one of the first to speak out against the book, was put on administrative leave, which sparked a protest at the school that she teaches at. Celebrities backpedaled their endorsements, and Oprah hosted a special two-part episode on Apple TV. So at one point, I actually became concerned for Janine Cummings after listening to her on the Latino USA interview. And this kind of came up in our group call, too. So I want you to hear that. Take two. Take two. <laughs> Welcome to our world. Something. Self-respect. She lost a lot. Her name's pretty dangerous. Her, she lost her name. She lost her reputation. I, I really don't think so. That's the crazy thing. That book is you don't still turning. So? You guys. But I mean, no. But just because it's selling doesn't mean that she has a good name. I mean, look. What that matters. Matter. She'll bounce back. back. I Look, there's mm-hmm. enough money behind what happened. She'll bounce back. And that's the thing that we're missing here is if this was a Latinx writer, that person would never be able to write another book. And I don't mean to say this. It's probably going to come off wrong, but it's almost like the whitewashing is totally OK. And she'll bounce back with another book. Interesting, because I uh, in the Latino USA uh, interview, she said she had one book that was already sold that was unrelated to this and then she said I don't know if I'm ever going to write another book again so um I it's interesting Rita that you that you feel like that because I definitely feel like she's um 
I feel like she's in a bad way. And I don't know if she continues to be in a bad way, but I felt like, um, I don't know if she'd bounce back, you know? So let me, let me ask you this. You sold your wedding rings to continue mm. on your project because you knew that you believed in what you were creating at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And this woman believes in her literary work. And as a person who continues to create constantly, you're not gonna stop just because everyone tears you down. Mm -hmm. It's when things are getting really hard and when you're getting torn down, it's when you know that you're onto something. I love your bringing that up. So I was gonna say one thing, and I'm just gonna say it just so I'm gonna get it out. I feel like my work and the work that I do here is extremely personal. And I feel like even though she's Latina, this wasn't like she's, Project Dating is personal, these are my stories, and then trying to bring to light other people's stories, but that I feel very connected to. The immigrant journey wasn't her story. It's not the Puerto Rican story, it just isn't, right? So that's that opinion. What Henry wanted me to bring up, which is what continues to come up, which I'm not sure, um, well, you guys don't have an awareness of this, is that our next film is about secrets. Um, secrets in the Latino culture. It's about the secrets we keep. It's about the norms, this norm in our culture, los trapos sucios se lavan en la casa. It's about that norm that we have that says, don't say anything because it could affect all of us, right? And so we're all going to suffer if you decide to say something, even if that thing that they're asking not to be you know, to be kept secret is shredding that person emotionally, okay? So at any cost is what I'm saying. And it's going to be thoughtful. It's going to be, hopefully, it's going to change a lot of lives. I am terrified to be the next on the chopping block. And this, what happened with this book, brought up all kinds of fear for me. We're making this movie because so many Latinas have come up to me and brought up their secrets. And many have asked me, would you ever make a movie about this so we could deal with this as a fucking culture, right? And I, and after, I don't know, I mean, there's many, many, many women have talked to me about this. And I'm afraid of being misinterpreted. I'm afraid that my uh, intention will be, you know, that I'll miss something, right? That just bringing to light this thing that we do, that we, that many of us participate in, well, like, out, uh, I'll get ridiculed and publicly stoned. So, yeah, no. So I think one of the most beautiful things that you said earlier was that you connect to this because it's something that's a part of you. You know, I never knew what it was like or what a word I could use to make myself feel like there was a space that I belonged in. And I remember the first time I heard about your project from my cousin Rocio years ago. This is when you launched the map thing. And I was like, she's on to something. I don't know what it is. I can't put my name on it, my finger on it. But I was explaining to my mother earlier today because I let her hear some of the clips. And I was like, I finally understand where my space is in this community. And I truly believe that what you're doing is something that is bigger than all of us. And you're giving people a space to feel like they're part of the community. And as long as you put your heart into that space and you continue doing that and you continue doing it, because <laughs> the only way to get rid of fear, right, is to continue doing it and be in that fear and be in that space. But don't stop because people need this. And if the healing comes from it, you know, so be it. But I'll be here. I'll be here to protect you. I'm giving you a big ass hug right now. Can I just oh, like, can you bring you. it? Can you bring it in? <laughs> just. I just I'm coming to Denver to hug your ass, okay? <laughs> That's it. I'm on my way to Denver. <laughs> Thank I need you. to go skiing before the snow is over anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you better let me know if you come here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> duh. We're like best friends now. <laughs> Commercial pause here, commercial break slash pause here. Uh, speaking of what you guys have created in Latina Podcasters, I when, I don't even know how I found you, but I'm so glad that I did. And it reminded me, because um, these guys were asking me, like, how did this all start? How did you meet them? How did this happen? 
I I saw what you guys were doing, and here's what I saw, that you guys were about raising uh, people up, and you guys were about supporting women, Latinas, and um, with what you had. And it was, and it was, and it was new. And I just, I was like, yes, right here, this right here, this is what we need more of. And if everybody could just take their little corner of the world and decide, I'm going to take some time and I'm going to, I'm going to plant some seeds here, right? And you guys feature somebody new every single week. And that means the world to those people, you know, and, and you chose me to do that. And I was so honored to be one of the people that you chose and, all the ways that you edify the people in the group and try also to uh, pour into the women that are in the group, whether they've started a podcast yet or they're just getting started or they've been around for a while, there's value for everybody. And the tone is so important. What you stand for is really showing up every single day. And that's why I wanted to partner with you because um, I, you know, I see you guys um, watering and giving sun to so many women in that group. And I wanted to make sure that someone watered you and gave you sun. And that's going to make me cry because this is how you do it, yo. This is how it's done. And it's emotional. And it means that you have to be real, right? And it's all the things. But it's messy, right? We have to talk about hard things and we have to coordinate lots of stuff. Um, but it's so worth it. Our goal with Latina podcasters and Rena and I sat on many calls in the Saturday morning with our hair sticking straight out. We did not look cute. And <laughs> we just talked about how we wanted to come to this from a place of celebration mm -hmm. and to stop focusing on what we can't do and what hasn't been done yet. And to say, this is where we're going and we want to take everybody with us. And our focus had to really be about how can we not let our egos get in the way? Uh, and how can we come to this without trying to compete with each other, which is so, which I think so many of us come from backgrounds where we're constantly competing, whether it's in our, our workspace or even just among like cousins, who's the prettiest, you know, like we all have these <laughs> ways in which we could compete with each other. And how can we actually like put our egos to the side and just say that we're going to do this for everybody because everybody's going to benefit. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, what we're doing is really about. Yeah. And it shows and it shows. So those intentions were incredibly important because that's what it feels like. That's exactly what it feels like. So thank you for that. So from my personal experience, I think that anger is a beautiful emotion as long as it is controlled properly. And I am proud of the authors who were appalled by this book and felt that they needed to band together. And because of that, now the publishing company that put out American Dirt is looking at more Latinx authors. I do also believe, though, that at times we allow ourselves to go with the status quo because nobody pushes up against things that are just normal because that's just how it is. But when you know better, it's your responsibility to do better. I think this anger certainly is a mask for the suppression of sadness and for the frustration. I struggle. I, I really do struggle sometimes with feeling like I have to be more than enough. I, I feel like I'm constantly having to prove myself. And I remember even as a, a young girl in high school that my stepfather always told me, you're going to have to dress up everywhere you go. You're going to have to wear the buttoned up shirt. You need to make sure that you always look professional because you can't get away with just wearing a sweatshirt and jeans. You need to always be polished. Otherwise, they're going to think you're uneducated. And you're always going to have to bring in your big vocabulary words. And that you are serious about your work in the world. And 
I think that's really hard sometimes because as much as we want to progress and have these amazing careers and to make an impact in our community and to make our families, you know, proud of us, it's a lot of work to keep up with. And yet it, we find ourselves in a place still now today where we cannot, where we aren't seen as acceptable. Um, this anger in our community is also masking the fact that we continue to glamorize the brutality of the cartels. I mean, we have allowed this brown skin is bad narrative to prosper and to thrive and yet it belittles our efforts and I think that is one thing that we really have to go after we have to push back on all of these stories that are created for entertainment from American Dirt to Narcos you know, to so many other movies and documentaries about the cartels where we just focus on this brown skin is bad narrative. How do we get out of that? And not to say that those can't exist, but where's the other side of it? So I can't dwell on my anger. It's not productive. I have no creativity when I'm angry. I have no hope and I lose all faith. I can't do it. I could if I wanted to, but I just choose not to. I choose to, to exist in, in hope. I choose to exist in hard work and in faith that eventually we'll get to the mountaintop when it's our time. But I'm not giving up on this. Even though these things happen, I'm not giving up on this. In the past, this book could have easily made me feel discounted or misrepresented. I worked in the television and film industry for over 17 years. This was a battle that I would take very seriously day in and day out. It would completely consume me to fight with proper representation with my employers, with my colleagues, and it was exhausting and it was also not healthy for my sanity. And I realized at one point in time that I was so focused on the problem that I was completely missing the solution. The solution for me personally was to hone in on my craft for storytelling, to not wait for a producer to come and produce me, to work on my craft diligently day in and day out for the love of it, for pure intention of it, not to be published by someone else, but to utilize the tools that are accessible to me. Just remember that we are all here on the shoulders of our ancestors and to continue growing and moving forward, we need to support each other. Whether you're in Central or South America listening to this podcast, or you live here, or you're third generation here, or you're an immigrant trying to make your way up here, we need to be able to come together as a community and understand that we all represent the Latinx, Latino, Latina, Latin community. And if we don't support each other, this stuff's going to continue happening. Boom. (laughs) I just got chills too. I hope you all enjoyed this amazing episode that really demonstrates the layered dynamics that live within our community, that not one solid body of work could ever, ever be able to showcase us in the way that we deserve to be showcased, that there are so many views, perspectives, and energies that require a platform that only we have the key to open, that only we have the magic to build, to construct, to create, to execute, to deliver. Understanding that our anger is completely valid. And after we let that anger burn in our body, that is the indicator 
that it is time to begin creating. May we all reach the 99th mark on our projects, whether it's the 99th episode on your podcast, the 99th page in your book, the 99th percent completion on your screenplay. May we stop searching for someone to open the door for us and understand that the door is always within us. And may the light within grow stronger. Benny, hi, I'm recording Papa, okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, thank you for this hug. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Can you please close the door? Okay, thank you. Return to the one. Return to the one.